Evet, tekrar hoş geldiniz. Ee, şimdiki oturumumuzda e, Kate Edwards. Welcome back. In today's session, Kate Edwards will be with us. She is the head consultant of the company she works at. She will be talking about the game culture and the new challenges uh, faced in our days. Now I'd like to give the floor to her. Hello, hi Kate, Hello. welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for joining us today. How are you? I'm good. It's it's nice and early here on the west coast of the US. <laughs> <laughs> it's about to be uh, a night here. <laughs> yeah, but it's good wherever, wherever anybody is. I hope everyone's doing well. Hopefully uh, you are staying safe too. Uh, yes. You can start any time. Uh, okay. You can share your screen. Uh, I can help you with the questions at the end of your presentation. Okay. I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, so in case you don't know about my background, um, <clears throat> I'm a geographer. And I have been working in the game industry for, as of next month, April, it'll be 28 years for me. And I spent a good uh, amount of time, about 13 years at Microsoft, where I worked on a lot of titles that you probably know, like Halo and Fable and Age of Empires and Forza and a lot of other things. And then I've also worked on a lot of other projects throughout the years too, like all the, all the uh, Bioware games and a whole bunch of other stuff. So what I'd like to talk about today are some of the challenges that we have when we're creating a game and we wanting to release the game into the global market. And I know that for a lot of you watching this, you're probably, you know, if you're an indie, you're probably thinking, I, I'm not, I just need to get my game done. I'm not even worried about releasing the game yet. But this is, I hope this will get you to think about the potential issues that you might face when your game does get released uh, into the global market and the kinds of issues that might happen. And it's definitely something you should be thinking about in the future as well. Um, you know, let's say, for example, the game you release becomes really successful and starts to become, you know, a, a really big thing, which would be fantastic for you. Um, it's going to get a lot of attention. And so you have to be thinking about the kinds of things that are in your game, the content in your game and how that's going to work in different cultures. So um, one thing I'd like to remind everybody is, you know, oftentimes when people are making games, they're thinking about, I'm going to make a game, I want to release it in the in North America and Western Europe, because that's where all the money is. But the reality, though, is that a lot of the growth in across the world is not happening in Western Europe or North America, the growth is happening in emerging markets beyond those those regions. So you look at these rates here, the 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 year over year growth rate in the Middle East and Africa, Latin America, you know, Asia Pacific, it's it's a huge amount of growth. And that and that will continue for years to come. And so that doesn't mean that you should not release in North America or Western Europe, but you have to be also be thinking about all of these other markets where there's a lot of growth, there's a lot of um, excitement for games in these markets. Markets. So one thing I want to make clear <clears throat> is the difference between localization and culturalization. Now, I think a lot of you know what localization is, where you basically translate the language. So you make your game in your in your language, whether it's Turkish or English or whatever, and then you have that translated into different languages. Uh, and that's basically localization. But um, more companies today are thinking a level beyond that. They're not thinking just about language. They're also thinking about how do we actually design our game to make it useful or to make it playable or to make it appealing to people in markets around the world who are from different cultures, um, different geographies. And that's a, that's a different issue. That's not just language. That's a lot of other things that you have to think about um, in terms of, you know, how do you adapt your game content? So basically in the process of culturalization, what, what I'm trying to do when I'm helping my clients is take the game worlds and the creative vision that they have and see how is it compatible or not compatible with the local worldviews of these different markets around the world. Um, and so this is kind of like this 
gene splicing exercise where we're trying to make sure the content is going to be compatible. And so that's this zone where I often look at the elements within a game. It could be character design, it could be environments, it could be the story, a lot of other things, you know, basically all the game content and I check to see, is it going to be compatible or not compatible with these local markets? And then if it's not compatible, what do we do? What, what kind of decision do we make in order to change it or not change it, whatever the developer wants to do? So when, this, when we're doing this activity, there's a lot of things we have to think about. First of all, we think about the values, like you as a creator, you as an indie developer, what are your values? What, what do you feel is important? And if you, you know, where do you decide whether or not you're going to change something? So for example, let's say you release your game and a government tells you, we don't, we don't want you to put this thing in your game. Um, what do you do? Do you change it because you want to make the government happy and therefore you want to sell your game in that market? Or do you decide, no, I'm not going to change it because you know, my game is my game and I'm not going to change anything. And that's something you have to think about. The other thing is the context in which content is generated is also really important. And the basic point of this is that we all have bias. Um, we, most of us overcome bias through education, um, but we still, during the creative process, oftentimes we might introduce things into our games that might show a bit of a bias, like using a character from a certain culture that is a stereotype. Um, because we just don't know any better or we didn't do the research um, to determine if that's a proper way to portray someone from that particular place. Um, also, the business strategy for the vertical. So this applies to larger companies. So if you think about companies like Microsoft and Sony, they make other things other than games. So they games are only one product of, among all the things that they create. And so they have to think about how they position their games business against other things like hardware, for example. Um, market strategy for a specific locale, so like China, for example. So how do you, what's your plan for, for uh, releasing your game in China versus releasing your game in the US or Germany or elsewhere? Um, and those, those strategies will be different. Also the market strategy for a specific game, because as, as we know, game, different markets like different types of games. Um, so the same kind of game is not gonna be successful everywhere. And then finally, the other thing that we have to think about is all the, the way that the world changes around us. And I think if, uh, if we learned anything from 2020, it's that the world is a very dynamic place and things can change very quickly. And so we have to be looking at the conditions in the market as we release our game and see if we need to change anything um, because, of those, because of those situations out there in the world. Now, one of the things that's been interesting um, in the last few years and is becoming more and more clear and more and more obvious is that there's been more and more pushback um, about content in different media. And I'm going to talk a lot about China in this because China is, frankly, they're one of the biggest um, perpetrators of this issue where they are, you know, they're, they're very picky and they're very specific about what they will allow and not allow in the China, in the Chinese market. Um, so we've seen China become more aggressive with content um, that is coming into their market, but they're also becoming aggressive with content that's not even in their market. Um, so like, here's an example where this Batman poster was, a, was uh, you know, they were, this was accused of uh, supporting Hong Kong protests because this was done, you know, during, during those protests um, several months ago, um, or like the, the, the gap, the, uh, the uh, clothing company, they made this t-shirt and you can see on the t-shirt, it shows a map of China, but a lot of uh, people were upset because it did not show the Chinese claim on the South China Sea and Taiwan. So like the t-shirts the these women are, are wearing were a protest. They, they wore these t-shirts and went into Gap stores and they, uh, they were very upset about it. And so, you know, there was, it became a big deal. And so Gap basically, you know, stopped making the t-shirts because China did not like the map that, that was shown on the t-shirt. Um, you know, even things like this were movie posters. We can see how when, when The Force Awakens came out in China, they took the Finn character, who's one of the main characters of this movie, 
and you could see how obvious he is on the poster on the left, but then they made him very small and kind of hid him in the poster on the right. And a lot of people, of course, they felt that this was a racist uh, act, you know, action by um, the people in China, but you know, that's, that's debatable, but it's interesting that they felt that they needed to change the poster at all. Um, you know, and we we have on um, like part of what I do is uh, I do a lot of map making and cartography consulting, and so we have this issue on maps all the time. You know, we hear these stories regularly in the media where you hear about you know a, a certain country doesn't like. Um, the way a map is being shown in like Apple Maps or Google Maps or something like that. And um, these kind of, some of these are just mistakes. They happen like this Ethiopia example. Um, it was just a mistake, but then other times it's very intentional. And um, so, and of course this, this, get, this becomes a very complex problem because countries get really upset about, you know, how their map and how their country is being shown. So, um, you know, but one of the things that's interesting is that this level of aggression that we're seeing over the last few years, and it's been really over, over, uh, over the last, like, I would say five years, where China has become much more aggressive about um, how it's being portrayed and how things are being shown um, in um, anything related to China. So you can see here how, you know, there's some of these are just examples of stories from the film industry. And the film industry has a lot of great examples of how China is strongly influencing the way that the films are made and the kinds of things that happen in the in the film. Like for example, the, the Doctor Strange one is really well known because in the comic books, the, the ancient one character, the mentor to Doctor Strange is Asian, you know, it's an Asian male. And in the movie, they changed it to uh, Tilda Swinton, the actress who plays the, this Celtic woman. Um, and they made, they did it because they didn't want to make China upset. And of course, who did they upset? Well, they upset a lot of fans because fans of the, of the comic book were expecting to see the version from the comic book, um, even though you know a lot of fans still like her performance. They felt it was a good performance, but still the, the fact they had to change it at all um, is disturbing to people because why is, why is Disney, why is a company like Disney or Marvel, why are they allowing China to influence the actual creative work that's been around for decades and that's kind of an open question so you know even this example was was pretty well known um a couple of years ago when this movie abominable came out um what happened here you can see this is a frame from the film and you see the map of china and again it shows the the chinese claim on the south china sea well there's several countries who are part of this dispute the philippines malaysia vietnam for example and those countries, they basically asked DreamWorks to remove this one scene from the film and then they would re release the movie in their markets. And it's just, it's super fast. It's like one or two seconds where you see this. It's a very, very quick. Um, now, normally in the past, DreamWorks would have said, yeah, of course, we'll take this out. We'll take out this little two second scene and then you know we'll release it in your, in your country. However, in this time, they did not do this. Um, they actually refused to do it. And so the scene was not taken out. And so therefore this movie did not release in the Philippines or Malaysia or Vietnam because of this issue. And part of the reason why DreamWorks did not change it is because they co-produced this film with a Chinese animation studio. And so there was a feeling that again, there was this influence coming from China that basically would not allow them to change this, which is uh, for a lot of people, that's a disturbing trend. Um, and as you can see from this map, there's there is a uh, there's a lot of disputes in the South China Sea. There's a lot of different groups that claim pieces of the South China Sea, um, and not just China. So, um, you know, or we've seen things, of course, in the game space as well. Like, you know, we saw that China deleted this this character, um, or this the, not a character. He's a player. Um, when he did a tweet about the Uyghur uh, people in in uh, Western China. Um, and we've seen, you know, the, the battle in between Hong Kong and mainland China taken into GTA 4, GTA 5 online. And so it's interesting how games have also become a battleground, so to speak, 
between this issue of censorship and pushing a certain worldview and also pushing back on that worldview. Um, and this is going to become more, this is going to increase. So my point here, it's not just about film. It's not just about television programs. It's also games because creative media has become something of a battleground of ideology between, you know, uh, China, between other countries as well, the US, you know, Europe and elsewhere. So, um, so we see again, you know, that there's there's censorship going on. Um, it's very active, and and the a lot of companies who in the game industry are actually pretty complicit, meaning they, you know, they basically agree to do this because they fear losing business in China because China is the largest gaming market today. And so for most companies, they will do anything that the Chinese government asks them to do. Um, and so this is a trend that is though disturbing because a lot of game developers, especially in the AAA space, they do this without thinking. They basically just go ahead and change it, whatever the Chinese government wants or whatever any other government wants. They basically just change it because they want to get into that market. And so my point in talking about this is that as we make those decisions, we make those knee jerk decisions, you have to think about how is that changing your creative vision? How is that changing the game that you designed? And if you make those changes that are being requested, is that still the game that you want to make? Um, and that's something that you have to think about. Um, now let's talk about content versions because this is really important to understand how we got to where we are today. So there used to be a time a long time ago where most companies would create what I would call a default version. And this could be for a film, it could be for a television program, it could be for a game. So basically you make the default version in your local language. You don't do any localization. You don't do any culturalization. It's basically, this is my product and that's it. And then you release it to the world and it might be successful some places and it may not be successful elsewhere. But a lot of lot today uh, that this was, you know, many decades ago. Well, today, a lot of companies, they at least do some form of localization. So you have your default version in your local language. So for example, you know, here in the US, of course, a lot of the developers will develop their game in English. And, um, and then of course, they'll have it translated to at least to Spanish and, you know, several other languages. Um, you know, so that's that's pretty common. I think all of us know this, and I even know a lot of indie developers who will do this as well. You know, if they have a little bit of funding, um, they will at least have a, um, you know, create at least one or two language versions um, that'll be, you know, so they can expand the reach of their game. Um, oops, and then we have what I would call a globalized version. So there's a default, there's still the single default that you created, but you do a lot of localization. So let's say you do like, rather than like five languages, you do like 25 languages. Um, and then you do some level of culturalization, meaning that you maybe change some of the content elements, like maybe you change a character design a little bit, maybe you take out one symbol or do something else. Um, right now, for a lot of games in the industry, most of the games that are created are this globalized version. Um, they have a default created locally. They have a lot of localization that they do, especially with big AAA games. And they do some degree of culturalization on the title. And, uh, and then they, you know, release it to the world. And then the last kind of version is what I would call a culturalized version in which you basically have, you still created a single default, but you have a lot of localization. You do a lot of culturalization as well. Um, basically what you're doing is you're creating multiple default versions when you, when you get this far. So basically you have a version, for example, that is fully optimized for, let's say for China versus the US versus Germany versus Thailand. And the version is so different and it's been so changed to, and basically you're doing what I would call proactive culturalization, which is you're trying to make your game a appeal to a specific market or a specific culture as much as possible. So you do a lot of changes. Maybe you might even change the character design. You might change the story a little bit. Um, so it almost is like making a different game, but you're still using the, the default version 
as the foundation for making these different versions. This does not happen very often. It's, this is very rare right now in the game industry to see companies make like a fully culturalized version. Um, but we are seeing that trend. There are more companies who are kind of leaning into that direction, especially in the mobile space where they have more agility to make different versions. Like we, they have live ops and they will do all kinds of different versions for different countries. So let me show you just some of the old changes, like some of the ways that these things happened. Um, like for example, with the, this was um, a good example of, of these default versions. So like in Windows 95, this is obviously ancient history um, from back when I worked at Microsoft, but you can see how they had a time zone map in which they would highlight the time zone if you selected it. But because India is a half hour time zone, it's it's not just every, you know on the hour, um, the entire outline of India got highlighted, but um, the government banned Windows 95 because it did not show the full Indian claim on the territory of Kashmir which is disputed between China and Pakistan and India. So because those few pixels were not shown in that outline, that's the reason why Windows 95 got banned. And so that automatically required us to take the default version, the US English version, and we had to make this other version. But actually it, this, rather than make another version in this case, we actually took this feature out so that there was no more highlighting of the time zones. Um, and then we had to do things like this, like this is uh, obviously a map of, of uh, Ecuador and Peru. Um, there was a dispute on the border that we had to add because, um, so we basically had to create, take the default version and create a localized version um, for the Latin American market that showed the correct border. Um, you know, we have this issue all the time with country region lists where things show up in that list. Like in this case, they were showing uh, Taiwan was, was showing up as a country and you cannot you cannot call Taiwan a country um, that will get you banned in China. So we had to fix that as well. Um, or even, you know, this happens a lot in games too. So like when I worked on the game Ninja Gaiden, you can see here how this, this line that says country select and it has the Taiwan flag and then it says ROC, which means Republic of China. And so this is a very strong political statement, whether you and so the developers did not realize that they were making a political statement by putting that right there, but they are because Republic of China, that's a term that's used for Taiwan independence. So that will get you instantly banned in China. If you show the Taiwan flag, that will get you instantly banned in China. And so what this line is saying is they're saying that the Republic of China is a country. Uh, and so it's a very, very uh, 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 problematic political statement here, but there's an easy way to fix this. So if you just, you take the flag out because you don't need it, it's redundant information. Then you use the name Taiwan because Taiwan is what the, both sides, both Taiwan and China use the name Taiwan. And then you say country slash region. So now the perception of whether or not Taiwan is a country or a region, that perception is on the user. It's not something that you as a developer are asserting um, to people. So now it's like, it's, it's a little more ambiguous and that's perfectly fine. And so by doing this change, you instantly make this game. Now this game can actually release in China and not be a problem. Um, but these these kinds of things happen all the time across different products, different games. Um, you know, like Apple, for example, they had to change their again with the Taiwan flag in the version that they had for Hong Kong. Um, they actually had to change it so the Taiwan flag was taken out because the Chinese government will again will not tolerate having that flag um, shown in in China. And um, what all of this is saying is that there is a battle going on. This is what I call a digital battle for mind share. And what that means is basically that governments, cultural institutions, different factions on the internet, basically people are competing for the control over public mind share and control 
over people's perception of what is real, uh, per perception of what is correct or what is right. Um, you know, all of this stuff we've been hearing over the last several years about fake news and all the kind of, you know, the the people being uh, being led astray on social media because they're reading things that are not true. Um, all of that is part of this dynamic and it does affect the games that we create. And so we're basically, what I'm saying is games are part of this battle. Um, just like movies are, just like television is, games have become part of the battleground for this for control over mindshare. Um, and so what it comes down to is who gets to define the global and local cultural narrative? Who? So like if you're China, what the, China is basically saying is that we don't want somebody from the outside of our country telling you know basically us who we are. And, and telling, you know, basically mischaracterizing us, but they're doing it in a way that is extremely aggressive. Um, so as we all know, there's a lot of programs now that have been pushed to basically control that mind share. So like in China, they called it the golden shield. A lot of people call it the great firewall of China. Um, Russia has the sovereign internet law. Of course, North Korea has a, has a internet block on their country. Saudi Arabia has done this as well. And of course, a lot of countries do this to a certain degree. And all of this activity is meant to basically control mindshare because in these cases, the governments want to make sure that the influence on their people is limited from the outside. Um, and games are seen as one of those forces that are trying to change people's opinion. Now, that may not be intentional. It's not like when you make a game, you're actually saying, let's see how I can change people's opinion. Well, some people do, depending on the game, but for most of us, we're just trying to make a game that is fun, enjoyable, we want people to have a good experience, um, but that doesn't matter because from the government perspective, you games are a potential threat um, because, of, because of they are creative media. So the key issue here is who defines the default version of your creative vision. Um, you know, so do you get to decide what your default version is? You know, if you're sitting in Turkey and you're making your game in Turkish or in English or German or whatever it might be, you know, or is, you know, do you stay true to your vision and have your default version or do you let these influences from the outside determine what that version is going to be? So there is a war on versioning that is happening right now. In the past, the default versions were accepted as a reality. So for example, China, they, they knew that there was different versions of the map, for, um, like the map example I gave you earlier. They knew that there's different examples of that. And then they knew that the map in the US is different from the map that they're gonna see in China. And that was basically everyone accepted that that's just the way it is. That, that's the reality of doing international business. But like I mentioned before, over the past decade or so, some countries have started to become more assertive and aggressive about what they consider to be the acceptable default version. Um, you know, and they used to be concerned about this only in their own boundaries. So like if, like I've mentioned before, like if you send a map to India, you have to, the map has to show the Indian claim on Kashmir, otherwise you're not going to sell your map in India. Just like, you know, if you're going to sell a game like uh, in, in China, you have, and it has maps of the real world in it, um, you have to make sure those maps are compliant with what the Chinese government wants. Um, and again, that's been the case for many years. Um, but um, what's happening today is there's that aggressive assault on what is allowed to be the default version, where uh, some governments are starting to overreach their boundaries and basically try and influence the default version that you're creating right now in your country. Um, you know, before the game is ever even released, before the film is ever released. And this is this is something that I find troubling um, because it's actually changing the, the creative uh, process for games, for films and for other things. So again, there's a lot of examples of this happening in recent years. Like for example, the China wanted the Louvre, you know, in, in France to basically not say Genghis Khan. They did not want a Genghis Khan exhibition because the Genghis Khan is a controversial figure in China. Um, and so, you know, that, and so the problem is that the museum in France actually complied because they were afraid of the repercussions from China. 
you know, or like the Marriott website, um, you know, they, the China shut the website down because it actually had Taiwan and Tibet as separate locations that you could visit in their, in their list. Um, you know, or even the, the three US airlines, they actually had Chi Taiwan as a destination. So if you're gonna like, you know, make a trip on their website, you could actually choose Taiwan and it was in a separate list from China, but China basically pushed back on the airlines. And what China was going to do is basically cut access they were going to say that these airlines cannot fly to the China anymore unless they actually fix this problem. And of course, what did the airlines do? They fixed it because they're afraid of losing their routes to China. Um, and this is this is a troubling trend. I mean, this is this is this kind of overreach is something that is we're seeing more and more um, over the last few years. And here's the example I was talking about Kashmir. We do this all the time in cartography. So like one of the things I've that I do in addition to games is I consult for companies like Google um, on their strategy for how they do, uh, how they show the map in different countries. Well, one of the things we did with Google was to perfect what we call domain tailoring. So if you go to different internet domains, the map, Google maps will be different depending on the local regulations and the local requirements. So like in the case of India, like I mentioned before, you have to show Kashmir as Indian territory or else you cannot release um, your product there. And so that's this is just an example of that difference that you will see. Um, you know, but again, India, India, in the case of India, they're fine with this. They understand that the map is going to look different in other locales. They're, they're not going off, you know, they're not trying to push other locales to change the map to look like the version that they want, which is that's what China is doing in a lot of cases today. And some other countries are trying to do that as well, because they're following China's, in, they're basically being inspired by China's boldness to, to basically reach out and try and get these the default version changed. So here's an example again, like if you go to the, the Chinese, in the Chinese domain for Google Maps, this is the boundary that you will see. Um, but then if you go to the Indian domain, um, if you take a look, especially up in the Kashmir area on the left, um, you'll see that it changes quite significantly um, because they, they have a geopolitical dispute over the territory there. Um, what's also interesting too, we see this kind of overreach even into iconic films. So with Top Gun, you see the scene from the left that when Top Gun came out back in the 80s, you can see that patch on the back of his jacket that has the Taiwan flag and it has the Japanese flag. But in the sequel of the Maverick movie that's coming out this year, they changed the jacket. If you look there, it's supposed to be the exact same jacket. But in order to make China happy, you can see how they changed the jacket. So they took off the Japanese flag. They took off the Taiwan flag as well. Um, that's pretty disturbing. You know, the fact that they would actually make that change in order to accommodate that market, even though, you know, the original film is very iconic. Um, I mean, a lot of people know this movie. Um, you know, and then, of course, we've done this in games as well. So like when I worked on Age of Empires um, back, um, we had this scenario in, in the game where the Japanese there on the on the right in blue invaded the Korean Peninsula on the left. Um, they invaded the Chosun Empire and basically just about took it over. And this is what real history tells us happened. And so the developers wanted to put this scenario into the game because they felt it would be a really compelling battle for you to fight because you're playing as the Chosun Empire. However, when the game released into Korea, the Korean government said that this never happened. So, um, so then we had to decide what are we going to do in order to release this game into Korea. Now, if you might remember back that slide where I said multiple considerations, the kinds of things you need to think about. Well, this is a good example of that because back at this time, Microsoft was trying to grow its games business. This was, this was just before the Xbox came out, a few years before the Xbox. So they were growing their games business on the PC. And we knew also from market research that, that Korea was a very strong gaming market, which it remains very strong to this day. Um, we also knew that real-time strategy games like Age of Empires were also very popular in Korea. And so basically we felt we have to release this game. We cannot avoid releasing this game in Korea, but what are we going to do? Because the Korean government says this scenario 
did not happen. Well, what we decided to do was create a special patch only for Korean players, which shows the Chosun Empire invading Japan instead of Japan invading the Chosun Empire. Um, and this, this was enough to make the government happy and the game was released. Uh, as you can imagine, the development team, a lot of people on the development team felt that this was not a good idea, that we were changing history, that we were basically, you know, let allowing the government to use propaganda through the game. Um, and from a business perspective, Microsoft felt, well, this is the cost of entry into the Korean gaming market. We have we either make this change or we don't go to Korea. And they felt that it was more important to go to Korea, so they made this change. And um, and so that's that's the cost of going into that market in that case. But there's a lot of examples of, of this being done. Again, this is a form of taking the default version, which is the one on the top, and making a culturalized version, the one on the bottom, and then having to make sure that you track the difference so you realize which one is the correct version and which one is the culturalized version for that specific market. Um, and then, of course, you know, this game, Hearts of Iron, these both of these games were banned in China because Taiwan and Tibet were not being shown as Chinese territory. And so, unfortunately, you know, these games got banned, um, you know, and, and that's just the way it is. I've already mentioned a lot about mapping issues in China, so it's a, it's a complicated thing. Um, and also, I, I'm sure uh, everyone remembers from a couple of years ago when Blizzard got in trouble because um, the winner of their Hearthstone tournament, um, he actually posted some pro Hong Kong statements and then Blizzard took away his award. They took away his prize. Um, but then of course they reinstated it because a lot of people in the public were very upset about Blizzard's action. And you have to ask yourself though, why did Blizzard do this? You know, why did they react in such a knee jerk, quick way and try and shut down the voice of this person? This and this this tournament was happening in Taiwan. It was not happening in Hong Kong. It was not happening in China. Um, it was taking place in Taipei, um, but they were very quick to shut down the voice of the of this of this person. And you have to ask yourself, because, you know, Blizzard and Activision are they they're Tencent, the world's largest gaming company also from China, has a 10% ownership over Activision Blizzard. So, you know, even though Blizzard kept saying, no, this has nothing to do with China, has nothing to do with China at all. I, th I think, frankly, that's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> that I think they're, they're, that's not true at all. Of course, it has everything to do with China. Um, otherwise, why would they even care? Why would they even shut down his voice? Um, so it's really interesting, though, that kind of influence that, you know, uh, over Blizzard's decision making. And I think they realized very quickly that they they overreacted and they, they did so in a way that they were not prepared to deal with this kind of situation. So, um, and like when I worked on Mass Effect, um, you know, this got banned in Singapore because there was a perceived uh, lesbian relationship in the game. And, um, you know, so there was people were upset about it, just like, you know, uh, Rise of Skywalker was censored in Singapore over this, um, because there's that very quick same sex uh, kiss at the very end of the movie. Um, you know, so there's governments still, you know, these are where they have their, their own content um, you know, guidelines that they, you know, things that they're comfortable showing and things that they're not comfortable showing. So as I'm closing here, one of the things we have to think about and remember is that when we're releasing our games, we're releasing into this content cloud and our games, the moment they're released, they're instantly exposed to the world and they go to a broad multicultural audience. So once you release the game, there's no taking it back. It's out there in the world, everyone's gonna see it. And so you have to make sure that you're making these decisions and at least thinking about these things before you release the game. We also know that community activism is very strong you know, on social media. So if you do something that a particular group or a market or whatever, if you do something they, that they really like, you're gonna have this huge outpouring of love for, for making something really cool and great. But if you make a mistake, or you do something like you show China's viewpoint, um, but then like what what are how are people in Taiwan going to react to the decision you made to basically satisfy China and not Taiwan? Um, and so you might get that kind of backlash. And so it's it's a difficult uh, path to to walk. You have to really think th think about this. 
versioning is very effective. I would encourage you that if you're planning to release a game, especially, you know, if you're thinking about localization at some point, remember that I would still maintain a default version. That model that I talked about before works very well. Um, so, you know, the challenge that you have is creating multiple versions. Um, you know, so and as you create multiple versions, you have to keep track of what version, like how, if you change the character, for example, in which version does that character appear? Um, so you have to be really make sure your your version control on the back end is really solid before you start doing this. Um, you know, but how much you version is completely your decision. I mean, nobody, you know, if you have a publisher, the publisher might kind of lean on the developer and suggest certain things that they want to do. Um, and finally, the last point I want to make is, is I, I feel strongly that you need to make sure that you're always exercising your creative vision. So basically make the game you want to make. That needs to always be the case. But just remember that your creative vision will not always align with the cultural expectations in these different countries and regions. And, and you and depending on the, the theme of your game or the topic of your game or the you know the type of game, there's there's in some cases you might get influence um, from a particular market that you have to think about whether or not you're going to change your game. So be conscious of all the creative decisions you're making during the world building process. And just remember these kinds of issues are out there when you're making your game. Um, so understand the potential versioning conflicts and know your moral position on your creative work. So under what conditions are you willing to change your default vision and why would you change it? And what are you prepared to do to for your game success? And at what cost? So th think about these things. I encourage you to think about this, even if you're not in that position right now of being ready to release a game to the world or make different versions. But um, I encourage you to think about these issues because as you advance in your in your time in the game industry, these issues will come up, and it's it, it will be things that you you, you will need to think about. Um, it's interesting that there's been a little pushback starting against this trend, like Quentin Tarantino, um, he, uh, the, the Chinese government told him to take some scenes out, like the scenes of Bruce Lee in this film, and uh, Quentin Tarantino pushed back, and he basically said, I'm not taking out I'm not changing my film. My film is exactly the way I want it. And if China doesn't like it, then I'm not going to release in China. And they didn't. And so that's a decision that we have to make as creators. You know, we have the ability to make that decision. And of course, Quentin Tarantino is very famous and he has the ability to make that decision. But I'm, my point is that every one of us has the ability to make that decision because it's our creative work. Um, so remember that you have to think about, you know, if a default version basically means pure artistic freedom, you're not going to change anything. And, you know, as you do more localized versions, you're doing that to maximize revenue. And of course, of course, if you're doing fully culturalized versions, then you are, that really the goal is to, is to really increase the ability to maximize revenue in the different markets around the world. And there is no right answer here, you know, doing only a default version or doing culturalized versions both are both are correct answers. It really comes down to what you, as a creator, what you want to do, and um, that's it. I hope I did not go over too much. Well, we have uh, like five minutes more uh, to answer some questions. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have one question from uh, Elif Iligul. Uh, she asks, do you think these wrongs uh, that have been done by several countries, companies, may be caused by the lack of education indu induced by the government or something else? I think she's talking ab about the map faults. Uh, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, I think the education part is a huge part of it. Um, you know, in some cases, like, you know, to use China as an example, you know, the, the education system in some of these countries does not allow for these different versions to be seen. And so if, if, if somebody wants to see like, well, how, how, how does another country view this particular issue? It, in some places, it can be really difficult for them to find the, the books, to find to access to the internet, to basically find out how other places see that issue. And that's the challenge is when they have restricted access, then it does obviously influence the educational process. 
And um, just to give you an example, I gave a, a lecture in Shenzhen because I was there uh, doing some work for a company and I gave a lecture to the employees there. And I showed, I showed that example of China and the South China Sea and how it's viewed differently in other countries. And after my lecture, one of the people came up to me and, and they were laughing and they thought that it was a joke. And they said, oh, that's really funny. That's, you know, they, they thought, I, they honestly thought I was just trying to make a joke by showing a map that is not, you know, what the Chinese government wants. Um, because from their perspective, being Chinese and having been educated in the Chinese system, there's only one map. And so any other version to them just doesn't exist. And they, so that's, they really thought I was trying to make a joke. And so I, <laughs> it was kind of awkward because I'm like, how do I explain to them that, no, I'm not making a joke. This is actually how, you know, what, what you've been told is not really the truth, but you, that's a very difficult conversation to have with people. Yeah, of course. And also I know that Iron Man on Iron Man 3, they added a whole new scene just for the Chinese uh release yes and also on world of warcraft they changed because of uh, they changed the bones and right. uh, bodies uh because it was uh, not appropriate to show bones uh, exactly on china yeah so but but see to me that that's ex that's an example of just kind of normal culturalization yeah I mean, that that kind of stuff happens all the time and i don't i don't really see a problem with that because that's basically a cultural value thing um it's not really political necessarily yeah but if you move on the political side and uh changing the vision or the uh manipulating the information that goes to your population uh i think there are some huge ethical problems for the uh game developers yes. uh, to if it if to release or not to release the game uh like it's a huge ethical problem it is it is do we have any other questions so you can write down to your to chat or uh, Q&A menu? Uh... And of course, if anyone has any questions, I, I showed my email. Uh, you're, I welcome you to, to email me and ask additional questions. So feel free to do that if you think of something, you know, after this. Okay, I think we don't have any more questions. Okay. Th thanks a lot for joining. Thank uh, you. It was a really, really great presentation. It was a uh, really, really good one, really mind opening one. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, we you. hope to see you again. Likewise. All right, take care. Take care. Bye bye. All right, bye bye.